Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Reagan Institute. We're honored to co-host this event today with Freedom House, uh, which is a group that does, as you know, such outstanding work around the world promoting and defending democracy and freedom. The Reagan Institute and Foundation recently launched our new Center on Civility and Democracy with the recognition that the decline in civility and respect for our fellow Americans threatens our democracy. Divisiveness and lack of trust are damaging our political process, causing Americans to lose faith in institutions and in their leaders. A functioning democracy requires trust, trust in our system, trust in our institutions, trust in each other, even when we disagree, and in fact, especially when we disagree. There is nothing that our foreign adversaries would like more than to undermine that trust. And one way to do that is to use false information to sow doubt about our elections. Regardless of the outcome, if they can make Americans question the legitimacy of an election, they have won. It's happened before, and our adversaries hope that it will happen again. Aggressive efforts are underway to erode our trust and deepen our divisions through disinformation campaigns. And we must be vigilant. We must be aggressive and proactive. The Reagan Institute has been working on ways to respond to disinformation efforts and has put together some basic recommendations. In fact, some are included in a document that um, is on each of your seats, and we're going to be distributing that information more broadly in the coming weeks. But we're grateful for the elected leaders and the experts who are here today to join us to illuminate a bipartisan path forward. First, we'll be joined by Congressman Brad Winthrop, Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee's Subcommittee on Oversight, and in addition, he brings the perspective of being a medical doctor. Then we'll be joined by Senator Mark Warner, Chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, who's been in the forefront of tackling the serious challenges we face. Following those conversations, we'll be joined by a group of experts to reflect on what we hear from the members and dive deeper into policy solutions. I want to point out that our friend and former member of Congress and co-chair of Freedom House had planned to be here today, but unfortunately she's unable to join us. So it's my pleasure to take her place as the moderator for the conversations with Senator Warner and Congressman Winstrup. So to begin our event, please join me in welcoming Congressman Winstrup. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you. You're welcome. Great Thank to you. have you here with us today. I'm glad to be uh, here. Welcome back, I should been say. Been here a couple times. I'm getting right. used to this room. <laughs> right. Uh, just to dive right in, um, in the last election, we saw an array of influence by state actors attempting to, to interfere with our processes. But non-state actors also pose a serious threat. And I know you've been spending a lot of time on this. Mm -hmm. Could you share a little bit about what kind of unconventional actors and unconventional approaches we might expect to see in the weeks leading up to our election? Well, I, I think some of them we're already seeing, we might just see it accelerated is, is really, and I think some of the non-state actors have been able to accomplish what some of the state-sponsored actors uh, have been doing you know, whether it's uh, through our social media, et cetera. Um, really, it, one of the big efforts that I think takes place from, from both entities is to create division within the United States. Uh, when we are not together on things, that's, that's their dream come true because they want us to be arguing about, you know, should we be supporting Ukraine? Should we um, be electing this official over that official? So it's uh, trying to uh, interfere with elections for somebody that they feel will be more um, amenable to what they want. And I just, you know, I think it's out there, and, and you and I were just talking, and you have this nice pamphlet here, Simple Ways to Stop the Spread of False Information. I think that's so important. And, you know, the other question is, while this is happening, is what can we do? Well, how many Americans can we reach to say, really know who you're hearing from? Really understand the source that you're getting your information from? And, you know, I will say within my office, I, when I put the things out, I always tell the staff, we, we want to frame it as reportedly this is, has happened, or if it's something I know firsthand because I saw it, then I tell that story a little bit differently. Sure. And, and I think we have to be better at that. Uh, too many things get put out as matter of fact, even amongst politicians. Um, and so I think we have to be cautious about that. But everybody, it kind of goes back to the old thing, when it, to remember growing up, you'd always hear, buyer beware, right. buyer beware. You know, as you're consuming information, buyer beware. 
and really try to see, say, is that really right? How can I find out? And uh, I, I get texts all the time and phone calls. And, hey, Congressman, can you check on this for me? Because I was just told that such and such happened. And uh, sometimes it takes a little digging, but we try to get the facts out. Well, that's great advice, and obviously that applies to misinformation from any source. But I think that we have domestic, and then we have our adversaries. Are there times when that intersects? Are there issues where the disinformation from one side kind of intersects with what we're doing here and, and even increases the, the spread of it? Oh, w without a doubt. I mean, if you, if you feel one way uh, politically and it's to the liking of an adversary or whatever, um, they're going to exploit that, and they're going to promote you and denounce someone else, and they find ways. So they pose as uh, an American entity many times, and you think, well, this is a trusted source. This is you know, some American entity, and it, and it may not be. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard because we have so much information coming to us. It's hard for you to check on absolutely everything. So if you can develop um, some trusted sources sometimes, I think it's, it's, it's the best way to go. But um, a lot of times we don't know exactly 100% of the truth. Just as an example, I always say, who, if somebody presents something, you want to ask who disagrees with you and why. Good advice. Um, you bring some special expertise, although the context today is, is election interference. Uh, on COVID and disinformation by the Chinese. And can you share a little with us on that and what you've seen? Yeah, so, you know, I'm a, a so soldier 25 years, just retired from the Army Reserve last year. I've um, been on intelligence. WHO, you can't have an organization like that if you're going to have some of the participants not really participate or try to, to, to steer things. So there, it's every facet, it seems like, of anything we want to deal with today, they try to get their hands in and steer it in a direction that behooves them. Do you think we'll ever, ever get to the bottom of what the origin was of the COVID? We will never get to the bottom of it because China will never release. They destroyed the evidence. I mean, when you destroy the evidence, it's a little bit difficult. And uh, it, it, it seems that um, some of the people who might have been willing to share some thoughts on it in China have disappeared one way or another. And that's a, I'm just telling you, that, that, that has happened. Will we ever get to the bottom of it? No. But I will say this, there's a lot of forensics in one direction over the other. You know, th that some of, it's, some of it I can't talk about, it. Much, much of it we can. Um, we've never found anything in nature. But here's the deal. It, what I'm working on as we have this committee is how are we preparing for the next one regardless of whether it comes from nature, comes from a lab. And my concern as, as, uh, as a soldier especially and someone on Intelligence Commission, Committee, the idea of, of a bioweapon, something China's been talking about publicly since 2005. Uh, our State Department said that they seek to use coronaviruses uh, and study that as a bioweapon. They've written books on it that have been published and, and not hidden somewhere. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of concerns that we have to have. And so uh, as I conduct this, this committee, um, I'm just trying to present facts to the American people and let them make up their own mind based on the facts that we can give you. Great. Um, 
you mentioned what, what we can do as consumers of information, but what can the government be doing to mitigate this? And are we doing enough with the election barely 100 days away? Uh, well, I, I think it, we're never doing enough when it right. comes to, to anything because we live in a world with adversaries that are always trying to, to, to do something. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, there are several things that, you know, we as individual politicians can do, and that, that's to be able to get out there and, and really just speak honestly. Just, we, we need to be focusing on policy differences, not personality differences, not accusing people of things that they may or maybe did not do, but just be able to stick to the facts so the American people can consume and, and make decisions. And, you know, I mean, I see this all the time. I, um, well, and I guess this could go either way, but I'm just going to use an old Reagan quote since we're here. We like those. And he, and he, <laughs> and he, and he, and he said, uh, he goes, the problem with my liberal friends is they know so much that isn't so. And when you're putting out from a position of leadership things that you don't either know for a fact or that maybe isn't so, we do ourselves an injustice as a society. Uh, in terms of what the government can do, are they working closely enough with the social media companies to, to try to stop some of this disinformation from spreading? Well, it appears that they were working with social media companies to spread disinformation and to silence people and to censor people. Those are facts. I'm not, I'm not saying that because it's some conspiracy theory. We now have the evidence that that's what was taking place from the top of our government. This cannot be. We can't tolerate that. We can't sit around and just say, oh, yeah, they probably shouldn't have done it. At some point, we have to say, these things are wrong. You're not allowed to do those things. Uh, and they have to be uh, some repercussions in some way. You know, free, free speech is free speech. You know, people, uh, <laughs> I can remember a guy one time, he was a policeman getting ye yelled at. He said, he turned to me, he said, I'll let that person say whatever stupid thing they want to say because that's their right. Um, but, the, but that's free speech. And beyond that, if it's causing harm, you can't yell fire in the movie theater when there's no fire. Um, we keep hearing how the methods that are being used by th those who are trying to spread this information become more sophisticated every day. Are our tools to respond keeping up? Are we, are we able to stay ahead of the game or are they moving faster than we are and, 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 and what do we do to catch up if we're not there? Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know how you have um, develop a really good screening process, if you will, and within our social media. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, it's, it's up to us to do the screening and, and decide what we want to consume and how we want to consume it and whether we want to believe it or not. But especially from foreign actors, I think that we should be able to track those down and, and stop that. I would, I would hope that any time we see that what's being put out has some trace to a foreign entity, especially an adversary, uh, that we find ways of cutting it off. But I don't want to limit the free speech of the American people. Is there uh, a legislative solution to this? Uh, we would probably have to legislate some type of, of law that allowed that type of, of screening to take place. It's, it's, it's a vetting. It's, it's, it's really challenging because I believe in all the rights that we were given under our Constitution. Right. Um, but it, it's at some point, you know, well, let me, let me put it this way. I used to see things in our local paper, and I challenged them on this one time when I was in front of the uh, editorial board. I said, I see th people write letters to the editor. If it's an opinion, that's fine. But when they write things that are factually incorrect and you can prove that they're incorrect, why do you print them? When I was a kid, it used to say editor's note. There were actually only 3,000 people at this event, <laughs> uh, not 10,000, right? You know, they would do some homework. That's not being done even in our, in, in our clearly domestic sources anymore. Uh, I, I mean, I, after the baseball shooting, right, they, they, they ran an article about um, how we've uh, increased security as members of Congress since that time. The headline was, why Winstrup doesn't do parades anymore? And I went to him and I said, I just did two eight days earlier. You never asked me. I was grand marshal at a parade. You didn't even ask me that, but that's what you put out. 
So we have a problem domestically when it comes to that as well as what our adversaries may be doing. Well, uh, we appreciate all you're doing, the leadership we're providing on this, and very much appreciate your coming over today to share your thoughts on us. And Anytime. Thank you for joining us at the Reagan Institute. All right, Institute. we got a lot to do. Thanks. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank appreciate you. Your thoughts. Thank, thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I know you were, uh, up, your schedule is completely jammed, and we're just going to dive right in, if that's all Amen. right. And, um, Perfect. All right. Um, you've got a lot of expertise in this area, and um, we have a barely 100 days before the election. And what can we do? What are you, I should say, what are you most concerned about in terms of foreign influence in the next 100 days that we should be on the lookout for? Well, let me give you the, the good news and the bad news. The good news is, you know, if we look at the European parliamentary elections, if we look at the French uh, election, if we look at the British election, we've not seen the, what we expected. You know, we saw Russia at some level. We didn't see massive uses of AI, because AI brings not just deep fakes, but it brings it at scale and speed that's unprecedented. That was the good news. Uh, the, the bad news is, uh, in, and I caused some controversy when I said this, uh, a couple times, and I think we're a little better. But the beginning of the year, I was saying we're not as prepared in 2024 as we were in 2020 under President Trump. Uh, and the reasons for that were, you know, one, I think we are better now, so let me be, be clear on that. Um, one is the power of AI, that at scale and speed can spread disinformation at an exponentially rapid rate. Two, foreign adversaries, no disinformation, misinformation is cheap, and it works. Uh, the documentation, bipartisan documentation that we did for full volumes, I think still much better than the Mueller report on the Russian intervention in, in 2016, you know, some of that was child's play compared to what uh, tools can be used now. Third is the fact that there was, um, you know, Americans believe a lot more crazy stuff how many people do you hear like say, well, I saw it on the internet. Moses didn't bring it down on the tablets, but I saw it on the internet and I'm gonna take it as, as gospel. It, it's, it's amazing. If you go back again, way back in 2016, uh, oftentimes the Russians had to plant the false implication and then, and then um, you know, uh, elevate it. Uh, but now they, don't, they can simply elevate or promote thing, crazy things that Americans say. And then finally, we did have this case that I, I think um, the Supreme Court, the Murphy, Missouri case, where uh, there was an effort to try to say that voluntary communication between government and social media, There's a microphone. voluntary communication between government and social media was somehow um, infringing on the social media companies. And that led to a about a seven-month, eight-month chilling effect. And I want to give uh, uh, Justice Amy Comey, Comey Barrett, you know, kudos for, I think, having an appropriate skepticism there. That this is a demonstration of wirecast.
past. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. the uh, Denver Chronicle. So it sounds very like it would be a, a traditional news outlet, and, but, they're, but they're fake sites. Would that, that might be like in 2016 when the Russian Black Lives Matter site had more traffic than the actual Black Lives right. Matter site, and the TENN Republican Party site had more traffic than the Tennessee Republican Party site. So that's an example we've already seen. How we we get at that. I probably agree with I think what the congressman was saying on this is that at least in terms of of some of these sites that are based foreign, uh, I think we can. And I, again, we have already in law um, who we define as adversarial nations in terms of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you know, Cuba, and Venezuela. So even if we limited it to those entities, although again, you know. It, it, let me quickly acknowledge that the ability, the Russians are sophisticated enough maybe to not have that site originate out of Petersburg and maybe have it out of Belarus at this point. So it's not perfect, but it is better than the fact of back in 2016 when first Facebook uh, and Mr. Zuckerberg said uh, when I made a comment in, in November of that year, any politicians that think the Russians or interfering on Facebook just doesn't get it at all. He had to quickly recant those words, especially when we showed that not only were the Russians doing it, but they were literally paying in rubles <laughs> uh, for the Facebook uh, for the Facebook postings. So. Um, I know you have to catch a flight, and we appreciate you joining us. But if I ask you one other thing, sure. we have, we've just put out uh, the, the Reagan Institute a, 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 a short publication on things people can do to avoid being caught by disinformation. Uh, at the individual level. Are there things that, that you would recommend that the average citizen do, the average consumer do, to be on the lookout and be ready and, and be able to, to ward this off when it comes towards it? Well, I think, you know, first line of defense is um, anything that starts to come out saying, well, your voting location has changed or the day has changed, right. flashing red light. Right. You know, <laughs> um, you, I, I, I do think as well, um, you, and this, this is, sounds trite, but don't accept information just because somebody said they s saw it on the internet. And frankly, um, people being willing to say, and thank you for that sign back there, I'm getting you out of your hair, you know, yeah, being, right. willing, <laughs> being willing to, and this is one of the hardest things. I think all of us, especially if you're in this room, you know, and, and you're involved with this institute and, and President Reagan, you know, it's being willing to call out baloney when you hear it from somebody, even if it's somebody you might politically agree with, that could be as effective as anything. Uh, I desperately wish that we had the, um, 
the kind of trusted sources of information. Right. You know, again, that I think uh, where, when you worked at the Post, the Post had, and, uh, you know, Post the Journal, the Times, but they are under assault in a, in a way that's unprecedented. Again, and this is on both sides of the political aisle. Let me make clear that there's undermining of those trusted sources by both sides. But trying to get back, you know, one of the, the one of the toughest questions I get asked, especially by young people these days, is, all right, well, sorry, I hear you're bipartisan, blah, 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 but where do you go for absolutely trusted information? And I kind of an answer? No, I know. <laughs> I used to say BBC, but I'm not sure I can even say that anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, for a long time I said NPR, but I felt like they've even gone, you know, they, I, yeah. and I, they frankly were more where my political view is. So, but how, who's going to be that kind of down the middle um, uh, source. I hope again, at least in terms of disinformation, misinformation around electoral process, that we will still, you know, trust our our electoral boards, trust our voting thing. You know, the because one of the things that, and, and I'll get out of your hair and I appreciate you accommodating me, my schedule, but you know, one of the things that could really undermine our democracy is when we have these constant harangues that somehow our voting process isn't working. We, we had a very conservative guy just lose a primary in Virginia, and you know, the voting process was fair, and somebody that, you know, one guy who condemned it before now viewed it as positive, you know, because he won. Right. You know? but, it's, but if we keep making these critiques, the vast majority of people, I'm, I'm an old guy, but the vast majority of people I've worked with or seen who are those election monitors or the poll workers, they do it for love of country and love of right. community. And we, when we chase them out or, you know, impugn their character, or in some cases, literally put them potentially in harm's way, we hugely undermine uh, the integrity of our process. And so, you know, standing up for those kind of nonpartisan figures who are kind of uh, key to the integrity of our system is, is something we all, all do as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your great leadership My, in this area. Thank and thank you for joining us today. My apologies thank again you. for running in. Okay. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Mark De La Iglesia from Freedom House and our esteemed panelists. Well, thank you for that introduction. It, it's not WWE, but I'll take it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark De La Iglesia. I'm the director of US Democracy at Freedom House. And I'm thrilled to be here to moderate uh, a discussion to get deeper into the issues you just heard from Senator Warner and Congressman Wenstrup on. Um, obviously, they have tons of knowledge and expertise, and we're thankful for that, and their bipartisan work on the issues. And they have busy schedules, so they can't go quite as deeply as we can here. Um, before introducing my panelists, I want to, again, thank <coughs> Senator Warner and Congressman Wenstrup and also really thank Fred Ryan and the <clears throat> Reagan Institute and Center on Civility and Democracy who have just been fantastic partners in developing this event. It was actually Fred and our co-chairs of our board at Freedom House, uh, the former Congressman Jane Harmon and Wendell Wilkie, who first came up with the idea for this event several months back. And, and it makes sense. It's a natural fit given our two organizations' values and missions. As you may know, Freedom House works to expand and defend democracy globally. And that includes addressing and speaking out about the challenges we face to freedom and democracy here in the US. That's the work that I lead at Freedom House, and, but dozens of other of my colleagues, including Keon here, contribute to that. And as you probably also have seen, we're most well known for our Freedom in the World Index. And 
the U.S. has declined on that index over the last decade plus by some 11 points from a 94 out of 100 to an 83 out of 100. There are a lot of different reasons for that, a lot of different metrics that we could get into, but I think we can say confidently that the proliferation of false and misleading information, um, particularly related to elections, is one of the contributing factors to that. Um, it's, you know, it's feeds into the deeper underlying problems that are plaguing our democracy right now, including a challenge to the citizens' trust in institutions, the pernicious polarization that we've seen, and even the tendency towards political violence. So these are important issues. And what to do about it, as you could tell from that previous panel, is, is less clear, I think. And so particularly given the need to protect Americans' constitutional First Amendment rights. Um, but again, these, these issues, as you heard, have impact whether they're coming from foreign or domestic actors. So we need, we need to act. These issues get nuanced and complicated and in a thicket very quickly. So I'm very happy to have this expert panel here to help, help us unpack them and highlight some of the nuance. So let me begin with introductions. Right here next to me is Kat Duffy of the Council on Foreign Relations, where she's a senior fellow for digital and cyberspace policy. Kat has more than two decades of experience operating a, the nexus of emerging technology, democratic principles, corporate responsibility, and human rights. Next to her is Gavin Wild of the Carnegie Endowment for <clears throat> International Peace, where he's a senior fellow in the Technology and International Affairs program. Gavin uh, served previously as the National Security Council Director for Russia, Baltic, and Caucasus Affairs. He also brings 15 years of experience in the U.S. Intelligence Committee, including co-authoring assessments of Russian activities targeting the 2016 and 2020 U.S. presidential elections. Keon, sitting next to him, Keon Vestensen is my colleague at Freedom House, where he's a senior research analyst on technology and democracy. And he's brilliant. I can tell you that after working with him for the past four months. Among other roles, Keon co-authors our annual Freedom on the Net report, which assesses the state of internet freedom in dozens of countries around the world. It's a must read. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we're really lucky to have Dr. Lindsay Hundley of Meta here, uh, where she leads the company's efforts to counter covert influence operations. Um, <clears throat> She has uh, just enormous amount of expertise on these issues, anchored in a PhD in political science from Stanford, and is an expert on foreign interference and the spread of disinformation and propaganda, both on and off social media. Please help me in welcoming our, our panelists. OK, so I think one, one thing I, I want to start with is just to sort of level set that I want us all to keep in mind what the, what the senator and what the congressman said earlier. And, and as I'm asking you these questions, think about how you might deepen nuance, agree with, vigorously disagree with something they may have said. <laughs> um, and also, let me just forecast that we, we're going to reserve time for questions and answers at the end. So hope, please, please do be thinking about what those might be. But I'd like to start with Lindsay, because I understand that you have the most kind of up-to-date knowledge of what these evolving foreign influence related threats look like. So could you give us a sense of the kinds of threats you're already seeing or potentially expecting related to the upcoming election? Yeah, of course. So I think I'll start with just talking about a few of the notable um, influence operations that we've been tracking um, targeting the elections. So I would say that one of the biggest changes in the threat landscape relative to 2020 is actually the amount of covert IO activity that's originating from China. So just within the past year or so, we've removed around seven distinct and novel influence operations that originated from China um, and was targeting a foreign country. Uh, this is more than any other country in the world. Uh, to just kind of make this a little bit more concrete, one of the most recent networks that we removed was a small network that pretended to be uh, members of U.S. military families or anti-war activists in the U.S., and they would share information critical of U.S. foreign policy, particularly on issues related to Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, of course, we're also looking at some of the other threat actors that the 
that our congressman also mentioned, particularly from Iran and Russia. We know that Iran and Russia have all been active historically in elections. They're going to be active again uh, this time around. I think on the Russia side, one of the more notable campaigns that we're tracking is a campaign known as Doppelganger, which essentially uh, its historically main tactic is to create websites that impersonate real news organizations in the United States and in the EU to spread false or misleading information about the war in Ukraine. But as of last year, late last year, we did start seeing this operation to create new websites that were commenting on things related to U.S. domestic politics and the elections themselves. So these were websites that were things like Truthgate or 50 States of Lies. Uh, those are kind of the actors that we're looking at. What I want to say in terms of trends, what we're seeing is that just saying that, yes, there are foreign actors who are trying to manipulate and target, you know, corrupt our public debate in the U.S., that doesn't mean that they're necessarily effective at that um, particular goal. Uh, we often see that these networks kind of speak in echo chambers to themselves. They'll buy their own fake, uh, Facebook accounts to follow their network to boost their engagement, but they're not really building a lot of authentic audiences in a lot of cases. We also have seen instances where when they do get authentic engagement, people are calling them out as fake, right? I think that that's a key difference between now and tw like 2016 is that people are a bit more skeptical, at least when it comes from like the types of activity that they were doing in 2016 to say, hey, this doesn't look real. And so that is, I think, where I would like, uh, I would maybe say one of the biggest trends that I'm worried about is the fact that we know that influence operations, what they try to do is they try to perception hack. They want to get people talking about them. They want to make themselves seem really scary. And then they want to be able to have influence in believing that, you know, our electoral processes were corrupted without having to actually do the work of doing that. They want to claim influence when the evidence doesn't pr uh, uh, predict that. So we're, we're still seeing that today, and that's something that I would say I'm on the lookout for going into this, this election season. Thank you. Super helpful. Building on that, Gavin, I know you recently had a piece co-authored in Foreign Affairs called Don't Overhype the Disinformation Threat. So I wanted to get, get a sense of what you were arguing there, and then in, more in general, how are you seeing these threats, and what should we, thinking about, we be thinking about heading into the election? So I think since 2016, the thing that I am most worried about is that our, our reaction to foreign disinformation is almost as big a threat to undermining democracy, trust in institutions, as whatever content might be thrown at us. I've spent the bulk of my academic and professional career studying a country whose leaders do not believe in anything like organic public opinion, who view their citizens as dim-witted sheep, empty vessels, blank slates that can be drawn upon at will by malicious foreign powers, and that um, that certainly doesn't seem like it's conducive to democracy, but I worry post-2016 for as much as we talk about making sure citizens don't lose faith in institutions and political leaders, that those same institutions and political leaders have instead decided to securitize disinformation and formal line influence so much so that they themselves have begun to lo lose a lot of the faith in the citizenry that they exist to serve. And so I think if you want to talk about foreign malign influence, I would love to talk about uh, bolstering FARA, bolstering the Lobbying Registration Act, bolstering enforcement of Section 951, bolstering um, media literacy, mm -hmm. bolstering online privacy. All of these different areas that are as important, I would argue, bearing in mind that we just had a sitting senator convicted of hiding gold bars from a foreign power under his bed. Like, we have a lot of issues on, under that foreign influence umbrella. I worry our volume knob on what is essentially being lied to on the internet for in a lot of cases is at 11, when all, a lot of these other knobs that are infinitely harder to do, but for which we have elected representatives and institutions whose job it is to address those issues, Disinformation's been something of a, a, a scapegoat and a bit of a, a distraction, and it distracts us and our own accountability and our ability to hold those leaders accountable for the political tenor of our conversations and to assume at least a little bit that the American public are not as gullible, that foreign disinformation campaigns are not as prolific online 
as we've been led to believe. And most of all, I think, contrary to what Moscow believes, that there is not a direct causal relationship between what happens on the internet or in the media and a real world outcome. And that that's a very complex relationship that we've oversimplified. And so I would say my biggest um, kind of fear about going into 2024 and foreign influence is much more on how we are reacting to the prospect, as Lindsay said, that we've kind of perception hacked ourselves into adopting Moscow's and certainly probably Beijing's mindset rather than calling it out for what it is, which is a vast oversimplification of the relationship between humans and media. Wow, thank you for that perspective. Can you say just quickly what evidence is there out there about the <clears throat> impact or lack of impact that you both cited uh, on foreign disinformation campaigns? I think, and, and Lindsay can correct me if I'm wrong, I think a, a great deal of the research and academic study um, that I've dug into, it's basically been a coin toss. We don't know. Um, we don't know how much impact th there is because it's hard to tell you know, just like when you're playing a game of poker, if I shuffle the deck one more time, absolutely I've changed everyone's odds. The hard part is I don't know what your odds were before that anyway. So trying to map that causal relationship is A, extremely difficult, but B, it might be an unsolvable problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, if we look at the academic research that works on this issue, a lot of times the work is focused on proving the existence of these campaigns, describing them, capturing them. They'll go to some extent to try to measure the outcome of these uh, influence operations offline, but it's really hard because there's no there's no one way to have an, like an impact on an influence operation. So you get these metrics like, oh, well, did they have engagement or did they have people view them? But a view and how that translates into like, an opinion, that is hard to unpack. I think there's been one uh, study on the 2016 election that really did try to dive in and pull from kind of what was the activity on Twitter and people who viewed it and how did that map to public opinion. And in that case, it did come up much more of a, a wash and saying like, the people who viewed this tend to have the opinions that they had already. It's not clear that they changed their opinions. They weren't consumed by a large, vast amount of people. It was the people who consumed it was just a lot of the, over time. And quite frankly, that what the biggest impact of the, uh, the you know, interference in 2016 was actually possibly what we were saying about people believing that it was a completely manipulated election by Russia as opposed to kind of directly affecting the public opinion there. Mm -hmm. Although we should clarify, there was more going on in that, in terms of Russian influence than just the disinformation. Yes. There was also the hacking and releasing. Yes, yes, yes. So the study that I was talking about was focused specifically on kind of online Twitter activity from the IRA. Right. Thank you. Kat, how, how are you seeing these threats as we head into the election, and, and how can we get a better handle on them? Uh, well, I mean, I, first of all, I would say, I mean, I, I am on record as having reposted and retweeted and rethreaded and re all the things. Uh, Gavin's article with Olga and his colleagues, I think it's great. Really recommend that folks read it. And Lindsay and her team do invaluable work at Meta, some of the best work in the world, in my opinion. And their adversarial, their transparency reporting and their adversarial threat reporting is... I mean, I wait for that the way that like actors would wait for the Oscar nominations. Like I'm, I'm like, when's it coming? When's it coming? And sometimes like they give me a little bit of a scoop. Uh, but uh, but so I I just want to say, unfortunately, it won't be an extremely exciting panel. I'll be the horrible person who's like, no, I pretty much agree with what they said. Um, I do think the perception question is a critical one. Uh, I think it's going to extend potentially to electoral security this year because we have had such attacks on state and local officials. Their personal safety has been so um, uh, damaged. So their, their sense of their personal safety has been so damaged. They have been doxxed. They have been personally threatened. And so we are seeing across the country uh, a diminished base of experienced state and local electoral officials which means that we have more newbies in the mix, which means that there's gonna be more mistakes. Just period, straight up. Somebody's gonna do something wrong because it's the first time they've done that election and they're gonna do something wrong. And the ability for that mistake or a series of mistakes across the country to then be aggregated into a narrative 
of malfeasance, you know, influence a foreign attack. You know, the the election is you know neither like, neither fair nor free. You know that someone has taken the voting machines. These are the narratives that I am going to be particularly concerned about in the week or so leading up to the election, and in the week or so after the election. Uh, and so again, you know, for me, I mean, my first paid gig in tech policy was helping Goldman Sachs draft their Y2K record. So like, I've been doing this a minute, y'all. <laughs> and I like, I was part of the original hype cycle. Uh, and, and what I have learned over, yay, so many years is that I, it's rarely the technology that is the thing that we really have to focus on. It's overwhelmingly whatever the societal problem or the breakage or the niches underneath it that then gets scaled or exacerbated by a technology and become scarier or more confusing because we don't understand the technology and so don't know how to lens it. So when you think about those electoral officials, that's a really, that's one example of where things could go. Now that Vice President Harris is presumptively the nominee, I fully expect that we are going to see and just an absolutely and ext extraordinary escalation of attacks on her. Nina Jankowitz did a study in 2020 with the Wilson Center, and I was, I, I, there's so many numbers that I cut and pasted it in before I jumped up. They looked at 336,000 pieces of abuse or disinformation in 2020, targeting 13 candidates across six social media platforms. 78% of that targeted Kamala Harris. She is a woman, and she represents not one but two minoritized populations in the United States, black Americans and Southeast Asian Americans. So she is like a trifecta for threats. We will see unquestionably sexualized narratives. She slept her way to the top. We are already seeing transphobic narratives. She's, there's a whole controversy there. She's not actually a woman, she's a man, uh, which is the same thing that Michelle Obama has gone through. We have seen the birther narrative already also getting floated for Vice President Harris. And so one of the things that I think about in this is I'm, a, I'm much less worried, honestly, about like AI-generated images, right, or deep fakes of Vice President Harris than I am on large-scale campaigns that are run based on internalized racism in this country, internalized sexism in this country. And then if you are a foreign entity, you have a tremendous amount of domestic speech that you can then simply work to just escalate or amplify in order to create a greater sense of discord, create a greater sense of foment uh, and, and inflame passions across the nation. And so I think a lot of times we focus on the foreign influence question because it frankly feels more comfortable because it is a them and not an us. But in many of the instances, a lot of what we're seeing is that the call is coming from inside the house. And that makes questions of jawboning in cases like Murthy very hard because we do not have the same protections for speech and for content that come from foreign influence that we do, that come from authentic domestic sources, right? Domestically, we have First Amendment protections. The Chinese government does not. And so that question of how we identify what is domestic, what is foreign influence, it is an incredibly hard thing to understand and, and, and to find attribution. And you really need companies that have the amount of information that Meta has to be able to truly look and analyze. And then we do need stronger information sharing channels between the companies, between the government, and between researchers. And that's my biggest concern for this year, and then I'll stop, has been the, the huge impacts on the information researcher community and space over the last two years and how far we have fallen behind and how politicized that work has become. Because that is, that is critical work, in my opinion, to our understanding of how society functions it, it, to the same degree that we need public health research. And so I really, I am hoping that what this election will do is return us to a space where we start thinking about our collective need for that type of research and that type of coordination and information sharing and disclosure to the public and away from what has been a very partisan 
an unnecessarily partisan narrative about these dynamics. Thank you. And we'll come back to the how to differentiate foreign versus domestic and as we get into mitigation. Well, not for Lindsay. <laughs> but I want to get to Keon. Um, we, we've touched on generative, generative AI, and Senator Warner said he's you know, we're very scared about the potential. We're not quite seeing it yet. Uh, but the potential is there. How, how do you think about the emergence of generative AI in, in terms of changing the risks around false and misleading information around elections? Sure. First, uh, let me echo Kat in being a huge fan of everyone on this panel. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, and it's also great to be scooped by Senator Warner. Um, I think I, I largely agree with his, uh, his assessment here. At Freedom House um, last year, we sat down and we looked at 70 countries around the world, and we found evidence in 16 of them that generative AI had been used to shape public narratives, to smear political opponents, um, or otherwise mislead people. And in 2024, in this year of elections, we've already seen cases of this cropping up in electoral periods in India, in Serbia, in Venezuela, uh, among several others. And here in the US, we've also seen evidence that generative AI is being used as a part of influence operations targeting American audiences. So uh, Microsoft researchers found, um, for example, evidence that generative AI was used in a campaign linked to the PRC to spread false information about the disastrous Maui wildfires back in 2023. Uh, and, and just earlier this month, the DOJ uh, reported that it had shut down a network of accounts operating on X uh, that were linked to the Russian state media actor RT and used generative AI to appear more realistic. But, um, you know, I think Lindsay put it really well a, a few minutes ago. This is tracking the existence of generative AI being used as a part of influence operations. The impact is, is really not clear, and it, it does not seem that these, uh, uh, either the uh, RT network or the Maui wildfires case reached people in any significant way. Uh, there's no evidence that it really shaped people's perceptions about politics. Instead, it really seems that influence operations uh, today um, aren't really deploying generative AI in enormously uh, problematic ways. They look much more like doppelganger, uh, as Lindsay was talking about earlier. Instead, that we're, we're seeing that generative AI gets deployed in electoral contexts in um, relatively innocuous ways. Um, people are using these tools as a part of everyday political campaigning. Um, in, in Pakistan, for example, mm -hmm. um, a former prime minister, Imran Khan, um, used a generative AI avatar to campaign publicly while he was locked up. Um, on uh, corruption charges. Um, and we see other examples in, in, in India, for example, where, where generative AI has been used um, for people uh, to post fun little memes about their candidates. Um, so, uh, you know, it seems right now that the threat uh, uh, is not there, that our sort of apocalyptic worldview that generative AI would supercharge disinformation <coughs> in a very serious way has not yet landed. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it won't. Uh, and looking ahead at the 2024, we still have our US election and several other major elections around the world. It's certainly possible that these tools could be used um, in uh, influence operations. If I could just add Please. kind of on that, I think one thing that uh, maybe some of the earlier, I, I, I wanted to be clear, I think that it's important that we take the threat um, of how generative AI tools can be abused very seriously. It's important to take it seriously because then you build the mitigations that are needed to mitigate against those threats. That being said, I think that we did ourselves a little bit of a disservice with kind of some threat inflation around that, and particularly the foreign actors' use of it. Because mm -hmm. foreign actors using generative AI isn't really new. There's been generative AI takes like um, generative adversarial networks creating profile pictures for a long time. And even there, when they started using them wide scale, they weren't particularly at the cutting edge of that technology. You still routinely find networks where there will be a fake account with a profile picture where half of the face has a mustache and then the other half does it. <laughs> and so I think that sometimes we, we want to, like again, treat some of our adversaries as if you know they're at the cutting edge of the technologies, that they're really kind of at the forefront. And there's some that are. 
but there are a lot of times they're hiring people to work out of a cafe that, don't, uh, that aren't at this, and so they're not playing that three-dimensional chess. Thank you. Anything else on the generative AI threat that anyone want to add? If not, I can move us to... I just think it's not about foreign influence, but one of the most interesting things I think we're seeing with, gener like with the use of generative AI around the globe is overwhelmingly it's being used just for campaigns. Like it's campaign tech that has really absorbed and adopted generative AI tools, especially in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in India. But we've also seen it uh, like in rural India and in rural Pakistan, for example, both last year and this year. We've also seen it increase turnout from rural voters. So it's, it's having really interesting impacts. Um, and it's increasing that turnout because it's an AI bot that is calling and the individual at the other end of the line, the voter at the other end of the line, thinks or seems to think that it's the actual candidate contacting them. And they're having an, a conversation, an iterative conversation with the candidate. And that has proven to be increasing voter turnout. I don't know if that's good for democracy or bad for democracy. I got to say, like, <clears throat> if the bot accurately reflects the policy positions and you're having a conversation with each of your candidates that's more or less accurate and that is more or less aligned with the questions that you have, and then you decide to vote because you feel more engaged in who's, in who's running, I don't, I don't know that that's a net negative for democracy. I also don't know that it's a net positive. But I think we need to be engaging with some curiosity here uh, in terms of how it's rolling out and how it's actually being used. Absolutely. And, and I think just one, one two finger on that is, is uh, you know, I think disclosure is really important so for important. the voter engagement side. Exactly. Right? Like, I, I really like this Imran Khan example in part because his party, the PTI, totally put a big it. label on yep. it, being like, this is a generative AI, right? No one was yep. being fooled that Imran was out, you know, campaigning uh, on foot. And I think the same yep. example goes for this voter engagement example. Yep. As long as the voter knows it's, it's, uh, not a real human being, I think that can be a really potent, uh, a potent tool. Just two finger on that. I think whether, it, whether it's influence operations on social media or, or deep fakes, so to speak, I think certainly since 2016, we in the research community and civil society have kind of put the public in a box where they have to approach everything in the media and online as if everything is a binary choice between reflects actual reality or is designed to trick me or fool me. Mm -hmm. And that's not most of what we see. Mm -hmm. That's not how we live. That's not how we interact day to day with most of what we see. And so like, much like the advent of many uh, audiovisual media over the last two centuries, initially a lot of pontification about what their business use case would be or the societal impact would be and the reality took a hard left turn, and it was mostly amusing ourselves and making political cartoons and memes. Mm. Like, that's, a, that's pretty standard throughout history, and I think we're seeing that again in, in the generative AI space. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I want to move us on to the efforts to mitigate and respond to these risks, threats, no matter how overstated they may be in some cases. Um, and so I want to start with Keon again. And if just ask you to give us a quick flavor of sort of how other democracies um, have, a, have approached this in terms of regulation and lawmaking around not just foreign influence, but the sort of regulation of the social media, harmful mis and disinformation space. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're lucky in some way that these are global problems because it means that democracies around the world are experimenting on solving them. And I think that really offers an opportunity for us to learn. Um, I'm going to maybe point to, to two examples here to, to start things off. The first is the European Union, who, uh, as I'm sure many of, of you all know, um, has recently enacted the Digital Services Act package, which is a sprawling piece of tech regulation. But one of the priorities of the DSA package is to ensure that uh, election processes are, are able to um, move without being uh, coerced or influenced. And that includes through foreign election interference. Just ahead of the, uh, this year's European Parliament elections, EU officials released a set of guidelines about how to interpret the DSA in the context of mitigating online election interference. 
some of this was aimed at steps that platforms should take. So for instance, the uh, EU um, asked that platforms, um, and, and perhaps Lindsay can speak to this, uh, conduct um, uh, a stand up you know, election incident specific um, units to, to counter problems that sprung up, and also to conduct context and country specific risk assessments relating to the elections. Some of these recommendations were also aimed at empowering users, empowering Europeans who were online to have more control over their online experiences. So um, one recommendation that, that I really like was in, uh, empowering European users to have some say in how content recommendation systems would serve content to them, um, or around labeling AI-generated content on the platforms. Now, um, certainly the DSA has its problems, and, and we could fill up an entire uh, afternoon just talking about this specific package, uh, but it really does offer European regulators a powerful lever um, to work with platforms around mitigating election interference risks. Um, there are other really important components of the European approach here. So for uh, example, um, ahead of the, the EP elections, uh, officials also put out rules relating to political advertising on the platforms and also help to launch a unit of independent experts um, committed to, to uh, fighting um, online uh, misinformation. Now, um, I also want to look across the Pacific towards Taiwan, which I think <coughs> offers a really important case study in how to manage uh, online uh, foreign interference in a way that still protects the, the open internet. So Taiwan, obviously, an enormous target of CCP influence campaigns, and all of these campaigns escalated when Taiwanese people went to the polls in January in a presidential election. Now, one of the bulwarks against CCP online influence in Taiwan is a little system called COFAX. COFAX is a sort of decentralized fact-checking organization. So it was stood up as a collaboration between Taiwanese civil society and Taiwanese tech companies in partnership with Taiwan's government. And COFAX basically operates in a way that anyone who is online in Taiwan can flag a specific claim that they see on social media and ask for a fact check. And then you have a network of professional fact checkers and citizen journalists, everyday participants in the Taiwanese internet who can go on COFAX and offer a fact check. What's um, really special about the COFAX model is that it's decentralized in a way that really builds trust among diverse communities in Taiwan and across the political spectrum in the country. Now, um, you know, I, I've spoken with, with many of the, the folks who are working in Taiwan on um, countering the CCP influence, and I don't want to misrepresent this model as perfect and say that it's flawless and, and works really well in every context because it certainly has its struggles. But I think Taiwan offers us one optimistic takeaway, that people really do care about the integrity of online information and that they want to participate in safeguarding their little information ecosystems. And one way to support them in this, to engage in this, in this is this sort of multi-stakeholder collaboration. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's really interesting. And just to clarify, on the Taiwan example, what's the government's role at all in collaborating in that? Are they just a receiver of information, and what do they do with it, if so? So the COFAX spun up, gosh, maybe five or seven years ago, and the Taiwan government was really instrumental in, in buying legitimacy for the effort and supporting collaborations between uh, the tech sector and, and civil society. It's my understanding that right now the government uh, is not overly involved simply because of, again, uh, building trust and legitimacy in, in the activities um, on the COVAX platform. Thank you. Gavin, did you have something? I just, uh, a bit of a divergent note, I think, on this. Um, I'm far be it for me, the former NSA guy, to wax civil libertarian. Um, but I, I think it is important um, that we recognize the limitation at the Reagan Institute, that we recognize the proper limitation of government, particularly in this discursive space. Um, I absolutely agree the Supreme Court ruled correctly on Missouri v. Biden. I also actually also very much agree with the DOJ IG mm -hmm. report that just came out a couple of days ago that said FBI needs a more rigid 
well-defined, higher standard criteria for when it's worth having a closed-door meeting with Facebook, X, or anyone else versus just going out and speaking to the American public transparently. Um, and I think particularly the deeper you get into this discursive space, the less you want your national security bureaucracy wading into those waters. Mm -hmm. um, we saw just this past few months revelations about a DOD commissioned influence op that basically spread vaccine hesitancy in the Philippines. Um, whether or not that was their intent, that's what came about. And so I think part of this solution space also needs to be desecuritizing a lot of this and having it be more domestically home focused and taking a little bit of the wind out of the sails of this kind of information warfare mentality mm -hmm. that I don't know can coexist with the bedrock foundations of free and open democracy. Thank you. Let's, so let's get into that a little bit more. Kat, if you don't mind, this question of what the government's role can and should be, especially when we're talking about trying to disentangle what's domestically sourced, harm, potentially harmful mis- and disinformation versus foreign. You know, there's part of what you kind of decried earlier about the politicization of, of disinformation is a, a difference of opinion about when, when that kind of an engagement is legitimate and when it's not by the government. And I, and I want to you know, acknowledge we heard a different message from the two members of Congress earlier. I, I took a note. When talking about the, the government engagement, um, Congressman Wenstrup said government was trying to censor Americans. That's a fact. And Senator Warner said it was voluntary communication that social, <clears throat> with social media that did not cross the line. So we have a decision in Murphy, Murphy v. Biden that sort of, even though it was based on standing grounds, the opinion pretty much broadly questioned the fact finding from lower courts that, that argued that it was censorship. We've got this DOGIG report that came out yesterday, which, as you pointed out, you know, did identify some flaws in the FBI's protocols, but also, as I understand it, said there was no violation of First Amendment rights. Right. So how do you view this balance and how we should strike it, Kat? Who in the room knows the term jawboning, which is the sort of operative term at hand? OK, not many. So let me explain jawboning, because I feel like we're going to we maybe throw that word around thinking of, thinking everybody knows it. Jawboning is basically the idea that a government official is using their, their power to make someone do something, to coerce someone into doing something that they otherwise wouldn't be allowed to coerce them into doing. Okay? So in the cases of, so in things like Marthy v. Missouri and these social media cases, when you're talking about censorship, or a lot of people will talk about these cases as the jawboning cases, it's a question of whether different agencies and different individuals in the executive branch inappropriately exerted influence over the social media companies, over individuals in the social media companies, to get them to change the decisions they were making about what content would be allowed up and what content would be taken down, whose voices would be heard, whose voices wouldn't be heard, okay? What you see, how you see it, and who decides what you see and how you see it is one of the biggest questions of our age, and it is unanswered, okay? <laughs> Uh, with all due respect to the congressman, I would say the Supreme Court would disagree with him that that is a fact. They, in fact, stated clearly that it was not a fact and that the factual record was so bad that the appellate court should not have let the district court case come forward and should instead have um, reexamined the facts. And in, you know, I only play a lawyer on podcasts, but, like, I've read enough that... That is, the, that is a smackdown from SCOTUS. I mean, there was, a, there was a footnote in there that was basically just like a knife to the heart of what some poor clerk in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, so, so in terms of these decisions, there was also another really important case in these cases called Vulo, all right, which is a, the other major jawboning case that the Supreme Court heard, this term that wasn't about social media. All right, it was about a New York government official and the NRA. And Vula is actually the case that you want to look to if you're trying to figure out where the Supreme Court is dropping hints about what is appropriate and what is not. And in that case, the Supreme Court found that the New York official was, in fact, guilty of infringing um, the NRA's rights because that official had pretty close direct enforcement authority 
over areas that could truly and did truly harm the NRA, okay? With the Supreme Court cases that you see around social media, the allegations have sort of been, they used really inflammatory language, which they did. Uh, like there was an official from the White House who was writing really nasty emails to someone at Facebook. Uh, those emails were n not civil in their tone. As someone who previously worked for the federal government, I don't like the idea that anybody in the federal government would talk to anybody that way. I think it's inappropriate and unprofessional and abuse of your authority. I don't think it's a constitutional violation. And that was an email about President Biden's personal Instagram page. It wasn't about COVID. It wasn't about anything else. And that was an email that came out in something like April of 2020. Who among us thinks we were our best selves in April of 2020? Who, who among us did not write an email or two we wish we could take back, or maybe the tone wasn't the best, right? So I think we need to put some of this in context in terms of who the humans were and how scary everything was in that moment. Right now, what we've seen with this DOJ report, which I think is really important, is a statement that as of February of 2024, for the first time, there is now clear guidance going out through the FBI, right, and going out through DOJ around basically what you can be raising with social media companies and what you can't and how you should talk to them and how you shouldn't. They haven't published the guidance, but apparently there is now clear guidance out there. CISA, the electoral agency, had a very clear footer in its communications all through the election saying, we don't have any enforcement capacity. We don't have the ability to make you do anything. Uh, so CISA was trying really hard to make sure that that was front and center in their communications. The, the overarching answer is we don't know quite yet what the difference between persuasion and coercion looks like because we're all really new at this. Uh, but if you think that the federal government is a concern, I guarantee you, you should talk to folks in tech about the California state legislature and the state legislature's capacity to engage in persuasion and coercion because they are also responsible for not violating the First Amendment. These same rules apply at the state level and at the local level. It applies to any government official. And so I think that's the other really important thing to think about in terms of how we decide these cases. Do you want a state or local electoral official to be able to go to a social media company and say, hey, oh, there's this big thing happening in my town and in my community on Facebook saying that our voting poll, like our voting doesn't start until this time when it actually starts at this time or that this polling location is closed, but it's not closed, it's open. We want our state and local electoral officials to be able, I think, to have that communication in real time, really fast, with as many information platforms as possible. And so we have to think really carefully about where we strike this balance. And in moments that are so quick, we also need to think really carefully about the amount of time it can take for a federal government official in particular that's got all sorts of limitations on what they can say and how they have to say it, if you have to do 42 clearances in order to send an email to somebody, you are not going to be moving fast in a space where things are moving incredibly quickly. So we're going to have to thread the line. And I think the most important thing is honestly going to be better education for the public as well about how that norm is being, how that norm is being shaped, how the companies tend to respond to things. And we're seeing more of that now with transparency reporting, with the DOJ report. I, we're going to get better at this, I think, basically. Thank you so much. I want to turn to audience Q&A shortly, so please get your questions ready. But last question for Lindsay. You are in quite a thicket here as working at Meta. Um, you, you, your reports, your sort of best in industry reports have already been cited about identifying the threat. How do you deal with this question of differentiating between foreign and domestic? and what does your approach at Meta look like to do that? Yeah, so the actual answer here is that we don't distinguish between foreign and domestic. We actually have a different approach here, which is to say that we are t uh, tracking uh, covert influence operations based off of the behavior that they're displaying on our platforms. And so, th in particular, this is a policy called coordinated and authentic behavior. It's very jargony. I didn't name it. 
take it up with someone else. Um, but the idea is, is that if you are running a network of fake accounts, pretending to be things that they are not, and creating assets on our platforms that are pretending and saying they are things that they are not, regardless of whether or not they're uh, spreading true or false information or just propaganda, regardless of whether you're a foreign uh, agent or a domestic one, you cannot do that because that is deceptive like there and through. Now, when it comes to just saying, okay, well, you found the network of fake accounts, you've assessed that it's fake, it's violating your coordinated and authentic behavior policy, where did it come from? Well, there's where we have a lot more just information in particular to say, okay, this seems like it was coming, originating from this particular country. Uh, we can sometimes be able to go as far as attribute it to particular entities and things like that, but that's kind of more into the uh, secret sauce of like how we're doing our attribution, so I don't want to be too public about like exactly what methods we're using for the purposes of not letting threat actors, you know, get around our systems. But that's the way that we've approached this problem is to say that there's just certain types of deceptive behavior, um, regardless of who is behind it, regardless of what they're saying, that allows us to be able to kind of consistently enforce regardless of the political opinion that's also being um, articulated. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the decision tree after that about what you do with it, uh, yeah, so we'll take down a network from a domestic, a domestic coordinated and authentic behavior networks. Uh, we're also going to take down so the foreign ones. So you determine that it's inauthentic. Yes. And that's enough. Yes, yes. And then you know when we're doing our public reporting, we'll do like attribution and things like that to the extent that we have the information available. So that way, you know, people know where it's coming from. Uh, other stakeholders could use levers available to them to hold actors accountable, but. The approach is to focus on the behavior so that way, you know, we know that foreign actors or domestic actors are going to target hot button issues. And so we don't want to get into the debate on if we're weighing in on one side or the other by doing this. We want a consistent standard of you can't engage in deceptive behavior, um, regardless of what it is that you're saying. Yeah, that's the advantage you have as a private sector company mm -hmm. um, to be able to do that kind of moderation. Thank you so much. Let's turn to the audience. We only have a few minutes left. Let's take one or two questions from the audience in sequence. Sir, right here, and then you back here. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, a great panel, great discussion, and, and the prior uh, uh, comments from the uh, uh, government officials. Um, so I'm not sure that the real problem is protocols that draw the line between what is a pro uh, allowable jawboning and what should be prohibited coercion from the government or distinguishing between foreign and, uh, and domestic and what the return on investment for Russia and Chinese and Iranian uh, influence operation is, but rather the fact that, the fact that we don't agree at all on the facts. And, and Mark, thank you for pointing out the divide right before us between two very bipartisan or at least moderate members of Congress on the, the, whether what the government did on, let's just say, information on the COVID vaccine uh, was appropriate or not. And Congressman Wenstrup, I gather, is a medical doctor and middle of the road, and he did have a very different impression uh, from Senator Warner. And there should be some basis for us to abate, moderate the vast chasm on, on what partisanship has done for common understanding of the facts. And is there anything we can do about that, you know, short of resurrecting Walter Cronkite or otherwise, you know, the trusted sources, there have been various uh, discussion about the trusted sources and where you go to get your news. But if the people who can influence members of Congress, moderate members of, con mm -hmm. of Congress, don't agree publicly on, let's just say, whether the COVID vaccine works or not. Yeah. Where are we going to go from the, you know, there? And I think that's really the problem. Thank you. Let's take the question back here, too. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent conversation. Uh, my question is, oh, one of my key takeaways from the first part was that even though the threat of misinformation and disinformation is there, uh, the effects have been, to a certain extent, uh, exaggerated, and, uh, and also it's difficult to quantify. My, qu my question was, uh, do you expect that in the short and medium term that this effect is going to be constant at that level, or is it like correlated with the quality of models that we have right now, which I mean uh, with more realistic deepfakes, uh, deepfake audios, videos, and actually text that can like imitate 
uh, the style and the word choice of some actors, could the threat become worse? Or is it more related to the computing power? Like with better GPUs, we could uh, produce more of this information and flood uh, new sites faster? Or maybe is it correlated to other factors? Uh, I'm very curious about Thank that. Thank you. Okay, we have two questions on the table. One is how does AI and further technological innovation affect the potential threat and its potential impact? And the first question on you know, the elephant in the room of our polarized politics here and how that in and of itself is in, um, <coughs> exacerbating the trust challenges and what to do about that. Any volunteers on either? I have a, on the first one, I would say we have to figure out some sort of sustainable revenue model for local media. Mm -hmm. yes. It's yeah. local media deserts are an immense problem right now. I grew up with one of the greatest local papers in the country, and it is now, I mean, basically just like a bin liner. Um, we see that with good, objective, local, credible reporting that citizens can understand and sort of vet for themselves, that helps create a greater sense of trust and understanding about how media is operating. It also potentially gives them access to reporting from their paper on national or state level issues, as opposed to what we have now, which is more and more local papers getting filled with stringers and getting filled with reporting from people they do not know and sources they do not know about issues that feel very far removed from them. And the local reporting is sort of maybe on sports, right? Maybe a little bit of a metro section. And so I think what we have seen with the news deserts that have grown up in the United States, these vast news deserts, uh, is that we have more and more distance of individual citizens away from the concept of good objective reporting that they feel connected to and can vet and question for themselves. And that makes it then very hard for them to vet, question, or trust information that is fed to them from broader national sources, even if it's good, credible, objective reporting. And so they turn instead to their communities. And if you think social media is bad for disinformation, beware the group chat. Mm -hmm. Right or in my you know probably in my parents' case the email group, uh, <laughs> but but because they are getting information from sources they trust. Gavin, you've written a bit on this question recently. Yeah, I mean on the first score, I would say beware the nostalgia for a bygone era, the Walter Cronkite era, mm -hmm. because a it was never as great as I think we like to remember it. Not that I was there. But B, the monoculture that we had back then that made it so seem so stable was largely because, I would argue, if you weren't white and weren't male, you simply didn't find yourself in that bubble. And so I, I think sometimes we hearken back to that, that era where it felt so stable and, and, and we had you know, trusted voices. A lot of people didn't see themselves reflected in that. And, and I think that's something we need to bear in mind. On the second part, whether it's, whether it's deep fakes or the proliferation of disinformation, the, the volume was never the issue. Like, I think the way, one way to think about disinformation propaganda deep fakes is like a Ponzi scheme that sells vitamins. It makes really not that much difference whether the vitamin works or what's contained in the pill itself. The issue is that that's not how, it's not good economics. It's not how money is made. It's not how capitalism works. I think that's the same way when we think about influence. We are, there's no magic mind control, no matter how much data, no matter how convincing. You, as a person, come to that media with a, a universe, a constellation of lived experience, linguistic, cultural, religious baggage, and you project that onto whatever you're seeing. And so it's never going to be as easy as if we just had all the right data and all the right tech, that we can somehow decode that relationship. I think that's a distraction from a broader issue. Um, and so I don't think it's a matter of better tech. Thank you. I, we need to wrap there. I want to thank my panelists, thank the Reagan Institute, and particularly Fred Ryan and Rachel Hoff and the whole team. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.